Today we want to talk about his calling out to us. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and continue on through our study. We're in verse number 8. And by faith, Abraham. Let's look at Abraham today. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was not which he was to receive for an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So I thought this passage is very apropos. I can relate to Abraham. I often likewise do not know exactly where I'm going. Uh, Lord, I give you my life. I want to follow you. Okay, so where exactly now is that taking me? And, uh, you know, I don't, didn't get the big thou shalt become a pastor. Never heard an official call like that. But here I am, pastor, and leading a church. And where are we going, Pastor Rob? What's the plan? Mm, we're not sure. So, you know, I got some ideas. I'm not saying that it's a vision from God. He gave me a dream. So that's why I thought, you know, this it's time for a survey. That's what the survey's all about. Uh, like I said, I have some ideas, but maybe so do you. And it would be helpful to have your input. You know, when Eliana and I go on vacation, we uh, lay out the dates and then we book locations and then we find places to stay. And, and uh, I do a lot of research on what to eat. Big shock, eh? And then, you know, look at the places and what the menus are. And then we'll, we'll write this all out. And then the boys, if they're coming with us, we'll sit down and say, okay, guys, here's the plan. You know, what are your thoughts? Because, you know, it's not just our vacation. It's theirs too. And we want them to have a good time. So we'd like to hear their ideas. After all, there's always lots of options. So that's what this survey is all about. The leadership knows the big idea. We know what our calling is and where we're going, but uh, we would like to also get your input. There are a lot of options of things we can be doing. So please take some time and fill that out. Okay, so let's uh, look at our next example of living by faith. It's what Hebrews chapter 11 is all about. Uh, and it's Abraham. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Now, like when we did Enoch and Abel, there's just one or two verses with Abraham, there is so much in Genesis. We can't read all of it, but uh, I think chapter 12 is a good place to start. So Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. So And so... You shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we call that the Abrahamic covenant. That's right. Three people knew that. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his nephew and all the possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired from Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. He proceeded from there to the mountain of east of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel to the, on the west and Ai on the east and built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abram journeyed on, continuing forward to the Negev. So the big idea here is Abraham is called by God Quite literally, God speaks to him and tells him, leave this place and go to a place I'm going to show you. And Abraham did exactly as he was instructed. Now, in the Bible, we see that is not always the case. Think of any examples. Jonah, he ran from God. Moses, burning bush, he's making excuses. Gideon, he negotiated for some signs. Sorry, Gideon's. No, no, no slight on you, but, you know, Gideon's out there. I need some signs. Peter, he debated with Jesus. And then later on, he gets this vision from God and he debates with God himself. But Abraham doesn't ask any questions. He gets the call and then does what he's told. Doesn't really know this God. Doesn't have all the details. Matter of fact, it says he doesn't even know where he's going. Kind of nerve wracking, don't you think? 
But you know, when you live in a small community like St. Mary's, you, you, it doesn't take you that long to learn where everything is because, you know, you get familiar with the area and there's not really a lot here. It's three roads basically into this county. One road running right up the middle of the county and water all around us. And if you're out by the water, you just turn around and go the other way and eventually you'll run into 235 and that'll take you right by Faith Bible Church. See, that's how you got here, right? It's great being on 235. Everybody can find you. And since there's no big metropolis, then we can talk about things uh, where they're located based on the proximity to things that everyone knows, right? Down by the base. Out behind the Walmart. We say the because there's only one, right? If I said, well, we're, we were over in Solomon's, nobody would say, well, I wonder where boats in Solomon's. I, 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 want, I wonder where we could find you in Solomon's. Chances are we're on the, the boardwalk, right? Only thing that's really confusing would be if someone told you to meet them at the Dollar General. <laughs> because nobody even knows how many of those there are. They just mysteriously just keep materializing all over the place, and they're just on every corner. I don't know what. I don't even know who shops at them. They're just there. In a small community, you know where everything is. But then if you had to, let's go to the, I got to go to the hospital in John Hopkins in Baltimore. Oh, I got to drive up to the city. I don't really know my way around. And what if some squeegee kids try to clean my windshield? I got to pay for parking. Oh, such a hassle. That's not my community. Why do I have to go up there? I used to get real cranky when Ileana would want me to take her to New York City. Ah, oh, it's so complicated. All these one-way streets. And one time somebody stole all my stuff. And there's tolls and there's parking so expensive. And I don't know my way around. And I just never wanted to deal with that. And she'd be navigating with, you know, with a map, you know, a little paper map. And she wouldn't really know where she's going. And then we'd be nervous and I'd miss it. Actually, we'd be fussing at each other. And it was just a burden. But then, you know, along comes the, uh, the old smartphone with the Google Maps, and uh, that's a lot less stressful. I don't know where I'm going, but my smartphone's smarter than me. It knows where it's going, and, uh, you know, it makes the trips so much easier. We don't fight anymore. It's amazing. Uh, but back in the day, you know, we would, we would go on a trip with an address and some directions scribbled on a piece of paper, right? You know, turn here, turn there. You know. Used to do that. You can't miss it. Oh, I hated that. You can't miss it. Miss it every time. You drive someplace, miss an exit, you drive for hours. It's one, wrong way. You know, in Canada, it's just like all trees, eh? You know, you're just driving, and the trees all look the same. You wouldn't know where you were. One time, Ileana, uh, the kids were little, and she thought she'd take a shortcut home, and it took an extra hour to get home. The next time we said shortcut, little Robbie's like, no, please, no more shortcuts. I think we've all had those experiences at one time or another. The wild thing about Abraham and his journey is this wasn't like I'm driving to New York City, I turned around, lost for a few hours. Abraham is, how's he getting there? He's walking. He's literally walking away from his family and he's never going back. He's going to walk someplace for the rest of his life. Doesn't know where it is, doesn't have a map. No clue what's it's going to be like when he gets there. Do they speak his language? Will they be hostile? No job lined up and he doesn't own any house, no property. He's just going to walk away from everything he knows to someplace he doesn't. Because a God he's never seen spoke to him and told him to do it. And he does it. And God is impressed with his obedience. That's a step of faith. That's not normal. Most people want details before they agree to move, don't they? My wife, she should have been a Boy Scout because her motto is be prepared. And uh, it's always ready for everything. It took me some time to get used to her. Uh, you know, first got married, I'd say, you know, we're going to go someplace. We're going to leave at 3, 2.59 in 30 seconds. I stand up, I grab my keys, I grab my wallet. I say, let's go. And I expected to go. But it uh, doesn't work that way, you know, because there's, there's bags to pack and there's scenarios to pr prepare for. You might need medical supplies, snacks, different types of footwear, maybe some coats. On the way, we got to stop here. We got to return this. And there's things to mail. And there's a whole lot of stuff that has to be organized and packed. And then once you have a baby, Garrett, oh, my gosh, you got to put in diaper bags and car seats and changes of clothes and strollers. It takes 20 minutes 
just to get out the door. But I can't tell you how many times we have been in a situation where we needed something and then Ileana's got it because she's planned for that. You know, oh, somebody needs a Band-Aid. I got that. Oh, my allergies are acting up. Here, I got a pill for that. Oh, I lost a button. Here, I got a sewing kit. It's just like Mary Poppins. That bag just keeps pulling stuff out of it. At first, I would be frustrated because I'm like always in a rush to get anywhere. As I said, we're leaving at 3. It's 3.02. Ah, let's go. But time and again, we would need something and she'd have it. She'd say, see? That's why it takes me longer to get out the door. I got to think about all this stuff. You don't plan for anything. You just walk out the door and then you ask me for everything. I have to think for everybody. And she's right. That's exactly what it's like. But he, Proverbs tells us, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. That's my wife. That's her new theme verse right there. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. And then the Proverbs 19 says, it is not good for a person to be without knowledge. And he who hurries his footsteps errs. And another way of saying that is haste makes Waste, right? We've heard that one before. So yes, planning and being detail-oriented is very good. But no matter how much you plan or how hard you study, you can never think of every detail and be ready for every scenario. You can never have all the answers, especially when it comes to God. Why will you never have all the answers? Because God is limitless. And God knows all, sees all. He's like a Chess genius who knows all the moves and he's looking at every move all at once. And our brains could just never contain that much data. And the wisest person in the world, Solomon, he even said that. He said, I tried to understand all that happens on the earth. I saw how busy people are working day and night, hardly ever sleeping. I also saw all that God has done. Nobody can understand what God does on the earth. No matter how hard people try to understand it, they cannot. Even if wise people say they understand, they cannot. No one can really understand it. We cannot fathom all that God is doing or what he's not doing. Sometimes we want to move and God's saying, wait, we're in a rush. And God says, no, you know, our, our Northwest Haiti team. No, you're not going to Haiti this year. It was disappointing. And that you got to trust that door is shut for a reason. So God told Abraham, go, and Hebrews says he went not knowing where he was going. Who finds that unsettling? Somebody find that unsettling? Yeah, somebody find that very unsettling, right? I can't do that, God. I, I can't go unless I know where we're going. Why? Why? Why do you need to know? I mean, he already had the big idea. He said, I'm giving you a land. You're going to a land. It's going to be an inheritance. There, that's all you need to know. And uh, let's get going. What else do you need? Well, honestly, nothing. But he wants to know, right? What else do we want to know? There's plenty that we want to know. Uh, we already know everything we need by faith. We have to step out. Uh, if you knew everything, would it be faith? No, because faith is the knowledge of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? Faith is illustrated when we trust and we obey despite not knowing everything. God has called you. Did you know that? The question is, this morning, will you take a step and answer the call? 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you might proclaim the praises of him who has what? called you out of darkness to marvelous light. That's the call. Out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Abraham got called specifically out of the Ur of Chaldees. Do you know where that is? Throw it up on a slide here. It's over here in around the uh, Euphrates and the Tigris River. Babylon. That's where that is. The Tower of Babel, the very beginning the, the beginning where all the religions started, all the false religions began. Babylon, who in Revelations is literally called the mother of all harlots, the author of all false religions. That's a very good reason why God wanted Abraham to move out of that place. The religious practices, the culture, the influences were powerful and they're very destructive. And we too, we are called out of the 
world, out of the darkness, out of the slavery to sin, but you got to answer the call. This is kind of what Tom was talking about when he said people want to be pure, but not yet. You know, you're getting the call, but you got to make that decision and choice and start moving out of the wickedness and away from the influences of people who want us to stay in these activities. The author in chapter 12 of Hebrews is going to say, lay aside every weight and sin that besets us and run this race that is set before us. And that is so often the reason why people won't answer the call. Because it means leaving places we love, things we know, people we love. You know, he's supposed to leave his family. It says here in in Genesis, his father, his mother, and all of his family. And that's often the hardest thing to do. Some of our parents, some of our loved ones, our friends, they don't want us to go. They don't want us to leave this. My dad, he built a house when he was 23 years old. My grandfather had given him a piece of land. It was his land, my grandfather's land. He said, here, you can have this piece and you can build your house. He borrowed like, I think it was like seven to $9,000. And him and his brother did all the work and uh, built this three bedroom, one bath bungalow, perfect for a wife and two kids, right next door to his parents. It was a smart move because that house today, look it up on Zillow, it'd be like two to $300,000, $9,000 is all he spent. But a funny thing happened. My mom went to church, heard about the gospel, the call of Jesus. She got saved. And then these pushy evangelicals came over to the house and some guys from the church, and they talked to my dad, and they led him to the Lord. And he was changed. The drinking, the smoking, the partying, he quit it all. Within six months of getting saved, he decided, I'm going to Bible school to learn the Bible. And he put a for sale sign on the house. Now, this is my earliest memory of all. I was probably three years old. And I remember this kerfuffle out in the yard. What happened is my grandfather came down across the yard, took the for sale sign, tore it up, threw it on the ground, jumped up and down on it, and just was creating a big scene, yelling and cursing out in the yard. And of course, my dad, he's 20s, he's going to go out there, he's going to deal with this situation. So he goes storming out of the house and shows my grandfather, my grandfather hits the dirt, and my grandmother's there, and she's yelling, don't, Robert, he's drunk, because that's always what was happening. He was always drunk, and there's always a big fight. And uh, my grandfather cursed my dad, and he cursed my grandmother, and he, he said, you can go to Bible school, and you can take your mother with you, and she can become a nun. Well, we weren't Catholic, but he didn't know the difference. So. Grampy wasn't very happy. You know, he's probably sad, confused, scared, and it all came out in drunken rage. My dad went to visit his best friend, a couple that my folks were very tight with. Paul and Betty was their names. And, and dad went to Paul's house and told Paul all about accepting the Lord and finding Jesus and sharing the gospel. And Paul got up and opened the door and said, get out, don't ever come back. And dad sold the house and moved to Bible school and 1975. Remember, he'd only known Jesus for six months. And uh, he had no clue where any of this was going. Yet three years of Bible school, he went into the full-time Christian ministry for 42 years. Now, when this all started, I was just three. I didn't know what the heck was going on. But when I think back on that now, I know for a fact if he hadn't made that change, I wouldn't be doing any of this. And I wouldn't have went to Washington Bible College, and I wouldn't have met Ileana, and I wouldn't have had my family, and I wouldn't be here. When my dad followed that call, he changed our family for generations. But he did not know any of that. He didn't know where he was going when he was 25 years old. He didn't know where that schooling was going to take him. He just stepped out on faith. And I'm very glad he did. I don't want to badmouth my grandfather, I always loved him, but the trajectory he had the family on, it was destruction. But my father answered the call and moved with no clear understanding of where it was going to take him. It was a step of faith. And we'll never know until we get to heaven. All that that has done and all that God has used that for. But he had to upset his earthly father to follow his heavenly father. And you too, we too are going to have to upset people when we answer the call of God.
And Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, if anyone comes after me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even his own life, you got to be willing to sacrifice your own life. You can't be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's what Abraham had to do. Well, dear friends, the author Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says, Holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. That's what he tells us. We too have a heavenly calling. You know what it is? It's the Great Commission. It's the same thing Jesus said to the disciples. He said in Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's what we're going to do here in a minute, right? We'll baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Acts, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now that you know that you've been called in faith, you got to step out. Step out from the influences and activities that pull you away from faith, away from faithful service. What holds you back from following the Lord? Often it's fear of what people will say. Uh, many times it's our own lust, our own ambitions. Well, we got these plans, these things we want to do. I don't want to give that up. What, what it, I don't know what, you know, I'm going to do this, but I don't know what Jesus wants me to do. And, would it even be worth it? You know, I've got all these cool things I'm going to get. Is it going to be worth it? My dad sold that house before he went to Bible school for $27,000. If he'd have kept it, it would have been worth 10 times that. Was that even worth it to sell that house? Question. How much is real estate worth in the kingdom of God? Wonder. If a 50-year-old bungalow has that kind of return, 10 times as much, I wonder what kind of return on investment one gets in the eternal kingdom of God. Have you ever thought about that? Savvy investors that are here today? Should we even think that way about the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus does. Matthew chapter 13, he said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man finds it and hides it again. And then he runs out, sells everything he has, and then buys that field because he knows what's in there. Nobody else knows. There's a buried treasure in there. It's very clever, kind of, kind of, kind of uh, sketchy, but still really smart. Right? And then he says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking pine for, fine pearls and upon finding one pearl of great value, he sells all to buy that one pearl. And that's what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of heaven is worth everything we have. It's worth it all. Give it all up. You won't be disappointed. And he says in Matthew chapter 19, everyone who's left houses, or brothers or sisters or father or mother, children and lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Let me poke at the younger people in the audience today. Some of you younger people. I maybe have, I don't know, 20 more years to do this. Maybe less, depending on the survey, depending on what y'all say. <laughs> I don't know. Some of our missionaries are due to retire, the Gales, the Onks. Then we've seen some of our faithful servants pass away. Michael Shores, Robert Myers. In order for Faith Bible Church and the outreach, the missions ministries, the Gideon's been going on for over 100 years. In order for those things to continue, new people need to respond to the call and take a step of faith. So who will do this when I'm gone? I don't know. That someone needs to be studying and preparing. It needs to start now in order to be ready to step up to do it when the time comes. We only get so long to do this, and then the time is gone. Well, you know what the pearl of great price is. We know what the treasure buried in the field is. It tells us that Abraham, what is he? Verse number uh, 10. Abraham was looking for a city 
which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham, we, like Abraham, we have these promised blessings before us. We've got to step out in faith and answer the call of God in order to receive this inheritance that is offered to us. Matthew 19, again, 29. If everyone who leaves houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, children's lands for my sake, they're going to receive a hundredfold and eternal life. Think about that. Take that very literally. I do. When I was young, I, my dad is pastor in little, little country churches in Maine and New Brunswick, Canada, and, you know, in the middle of the woods and four people and an old, old lady on a pipe, pump organ, you know, playing some old hymns. And that was the church. And uh, I'd look at that stuff and, and uh, you know, it all was very boring. Have you ever sat in a church with five people and an old lady on a pump organ playing a hymn? I, it was hot up here today. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. This was really cooking. You guys were doing a great job. That wasn't church where I came from. You know, I was bored. And, but then what I saw in the movies and in sports arenas and magazines and MTV, I don't have that anymore. Right? Oh, that looks so exciting. I want to experience that. But you get a little older and you learn very quickly, you know, most of that is out of my price range. And even the people who actually get all that, never fulfills them. You see it time and time again. People destroy their lives. They watch their fame and their fortune slip through their fingers. Even if they live a long life and have all these goods for a long life, it's never long enough. Life's a vapor. You know, it's just this, this year, I was shaking my head, poor thing. Madonna, right? In the 80s, oh man, she was young and hot and everybody adored her. And now in 2023, everybody's making fun of her facelift and, and thinks she's cringy, right? That's the way it is. It's vanity out there. What the world offers you will never satisfy. But a step of faith, serving the Lord, building his kingdom, man, I'm going to tell you, I was so wrong when I was young. Big shock, eh? Being young and being wrong. I, 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 this has been an amazing time. It has not been boring. It's been exciting to see God at work. When I was young, the things that I loved to do, those things have all come back to me when I stepped out to serve the Lord. I, I love sports, right? I wanted to be into sports. Man, I stepped out to serve the Lord and went to Bible college. I played college ball. I coached teams. I built programs. And I've competed in championships. I did way more sports than I ever would have did outside of serving the Lord. You know, love music. You know, all that. I tell you what, watching my sons grow up here and go to King's Christian Academy and serve the Lord and our music ministry here, man, it is better than anything else going on in this county, right? And they're always in here. It is an awesome thing. It inspires me. And the world's always promoting fame. Well, fa fame is such a pitfall. I'm so glad I don't have to deal with any of that. However, I, I do have this community, brothers and sisters in Christ who you know, appreciate me and know me and try to help me. And uh, I get to stand up every week and do this. And I'm going to be honest with you. When I was young, I thought this would be just scary. I look at my dad and I was terrified. Like, man, you get up there and preach. And I couldn't do that. I wouldn't even know what to say for five minutes. It just looks stupid standing up there. But uh, now I'll be honest with you. I love doing this. This is just, you know, I know I sound weird. I embarrass my family and myself rolling around on the stage, acting out my little stories, but I'm just in awe. People show up and, and it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit at work, you know, just honor to be used by him. You know, seeing the world, I have traveled to several countries serving the Lord. It's going on missions trips and Lord willing, we got another one planned for the end of the year. Eliana and I have been invited to speak at a missions conference in Spain you know, where our, our missionaries, the Bethels, they were overseeing the entire mission board in Spain. And they got all these missionary families and they, they're going to bring them all in for this conference. And they want me and Eliana to go over there. And we're going to deal with uh, helping them with church leadership development. We're going to help them with philosophy of ministry. Eliana's counseling side is going to do marriage and parenting workshops. We just did one, a marriage a parenting workshop Saturday. Basically all the stuff that we do here, we're just going to cram it all into one week and do it over there. But serving the Lord, it has taken me all over the world. You know, and then Hollywood, why do they always show you about, you know, romance, you know? Ooh. I met my wife in Bible college, and we've been married for almost 30 years, and we still flirt with each other, and the romance is still going strong. 
You get all that when you trust the Lord. He gives you all the desires of your heart. That verse, very literally, you will receive a hundredfold. And what else? Eternal life. I feel like I've already got a hundredfold and I still got a heavenly investment, you know, for me, for all of eternity. And that's what God is offering you. Abraham followed that call, looking for that city whose architect and builder is God. That foundation. Who's the chief cornerstone of the foundation of our faith? Jesus Christ. We speak Jesus. Amen. His word is the foundation. We build our life upon the rock. Jesus says the man that builds his life upon the rock can weather all the storms. Your house, your life will stand when the chaos comes. That's what we want to build here, Faith Bible Church. This is our vision to spiritually impact everyone in our community until everyone understands the good news. We want everyone to have their life built on this firm foundation. The author of Hebrews is telling us in chapter 11 how to gain God's approval. He's giving us all these examples of faith. And one of them is Abraham who answered the call and invested in the kingdom and was part of what God was building. And that's where I believe we are to go, Faith Bible Church. I hope and I am pray that includes everyone here. But I know not everyone came in here today committed to following God. But it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will inspire you with Abraham's life and Abraham's testimony, and you will hear the call of God, and you will commit yourself to following God. Trust me, it is worth it. You're not a fool who steps out to follow the Lord. Lord, help each and every one as we step out by faith to serve you, to answer that call, to give you everything you ask for, to go wherever you lead. Lord, we just thank you for young Emily as she steps out here today. She's taking a step of faith. She's answering that call. We pray that you would touch each and every heart. Each and every person would take that next step of faith that is before them and do great things for you as we look back over our lives and realize, wow, God, you've done all these things. But it starts with that first beginning step of saying, all right, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do this thing that you've told me to do. I'm going to change this part of my life that needs to change. I'm going to do it now, not wait. Lord, we just pray that you'll help people. Someone here today, take that step of faith and believe in you for great things. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.